Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about how to prepare for a HMRC customs audit brought to you by the Institute of Export and International Trade. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Senior Content Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host for this afternoon. And on the next slide, it is my delight to welcome our speaker today. Uh, yeah, there we go. And Suzanne Adequim. Hi, Suzanne. Great to have you here with us again. How are you today? Hi, Will. It's great to be here again today. Um, I'm really well, thank you. Had a great weekend. Um, going on holiday later this week, so looking forward to it. Excellent stuff. What a time to go on holiday and hopefully the <laughs> weather is better where you're going than where it is today in North London. Um, <laughs> but as you can see, Suzanne is a customs and trade specialist at the Institute. And many of you would have heard her on the excellent webinar on plastic packaging tax earlier this month. So you're definitely in safe hands today. But on the next slide, before we get into the presentations, uh, we're going to run a quick poll to find out a little bit more about you, our audience. So we're asking you here whether you've had a cost customs audit uh, in the last five years. So it's going to launch that now. Options are yes, no, or not sure. While you are answering that poll, three housekeeping notes for me today. Firstly, this webinar is a follow-up to a session we ran on compliance requirements after declarations are submitted. We ran that earlier this month, and if you missed it, you can watch it back on our YouTube channel, and I'll post the link in the chat in a few seconds. Secondly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window to the right hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions during the Q&A today, but please note we cannot guarantee that we will get to every question in the allocated time, which today is 45 minutes. As such, I'll be prioritising questions that are specific to today's topic and which have relevance to the wider audience. So I won't be going into company or sector specific queries as such. Finally, you will receive access to today's slide pack as well as a recording of the webinar. In a follow up email, we will be sending over the next day or so. So please do try to listen in as carefully as you can to today's presentation. Well, for now, I'm going to close the poll. Thank you, everyone, for responding. There's a, a decent number of people on the line today, five, over 550. So uh, very interesting to see the response. So 30, just under 30% of you have had an audit in the last five years. 44% of you say no, you haven't. And 27% of you not sure. And we suspect there's probably been a few people who have joined or moved companies in that period of time. So thank you everyone for answering, really interesting response as ever. But on the next slide, to tell you how to prepare for an audit, if were, one were to happen in your company, I'm going to hand over to Suzanne. Over to you, Suzanne. Thank you, Will. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. Um, today, we're going to be looking at what you need to do and how to prepare for a HMRC audit. We're going to start off by looking at what is a HMRC audit, why would HMRC want to come and audit you, and we'll look at what you as a trader can do to make sure that you operate best practice so that you can demonstrate your compliance to HMRC. We'll have a look at the VAT requirements and go through the customs documentation that you need to keep on file. We'll also cover some special audit requirements for areas where a trader has those special customs authorizations. These areas are also likely to be audited by HMRC for compliance. We'll also explore what happens after you've been audited, what to expect, and we've got some information on how to prepare for an audit and final considerations for you to check that your business is ready. So what is a HMRC audit? Well, HMRC carry out audits of businesses from time to time to make sure that traders are paying the right amount of tax at the right time, to check that they're getting the right allowances and tax reliefs, to discourage tax evasion, and to make sure that the tax system is working fairly for the traders. For international trade, they will be checking that the non-charging of VAT on exports has been recorded correctly and that the documentary evidence to support this is in place. For international trade documentation, the time period is a minimum of four years for record keeping. 
However, for tax purposes, the time period is a minimum of six years. And as international trade documents are usually the supplementary evidence for the tax records, they do typically all end up being required to be held on file for a minimum of six years. On imports, they will check that all relevant duties and taxes have been paid. Any imports where preference or a lower rate of duty, so for example under GSP, has been applied. Do you hold the correct evidence to support this, such as origin statements or certificates of origin? The compliance check could be just a formality, or it may be that there has been an inconsistency in traders' records that's come to the attention of HMRC. So why would HMRC want to carry out an audit? Well, there are a number of reasons. They may have received a tip-off about dubious tax practices. HMRC themselves may have observed regular mistakes on tax returns. Submitting inaccurate figures or information year on year, they may start to ask questions as to whether these errors are really as they appear. There could be a fluctuation in the profits declared from one year to the next. A trader may be submitting continual unprofitable tax returns, which would suggest that the business should really not be trading. You may not have even appointed an accountant and you're only making self-assessments. All of these are examples that may flag up to HMRC, who will then want to carry out a compliance check and audit the business. Carry out audits helps traders to improve compliance. By highlighting areas that are falling short of requirements, it prevents small issues becoming bigger problems, which may result in duty reclaims and time-consuming appeals. It helps traders to tighten up their supply chain, making imports and exports more robust as traders understand the implications of each step in their supply chain. This ultimately will reduce costs as traders will be able to plan their supply chains more effectively, take advantage of schemes to mitigate tax and duty costs, and defer tax and duty payments where possible. By having procedures and processes reviewed under audit ensures that business operations are compliant HMRC may decide to physically come on site to carry out the audit, or they may contact a trader to ask for documentation relating to specific shipments to be posted out to them or even emailed over as well. And this has been more the practice that I've seen in the last couple of years due to the COVID restrictions. HMRC have a charter in place, which explains what a trader can expect from them and what they expect from the trader. All information the trader provides to HMRC will be protected and safe. And any HMRC officer will always be professional, acting with integrity, respect and courtesy in all forms of communication as well as in person. HMRC want to help and support traders. Therefore, the audit is seen as a tool to help traders to become compliant with the tax regulations. Being open and honest and helpful to assist the officer with their inquiries is the best practice to adopt and will help with the resolution and follow-up after the audit has taken place. So what are HMRC looking for? When HMRC carry out an audit, they're going to be looking for evidence of customs controls and checks that the business will have in place. They are looking to identify errors, which can demonstrate either a one-off error or it may be something that leads to the discovery of a potential major issue that needs to be resolved. HMRC can get an idea of the financial security of the business by having sound practices, processes and procedures in place will demonstrate that a business is acting with integrity, carrying out due diligence and is operating to best practice to the best of its ability. It will also reveal the technical capabilities of the staff within a business, the customs technical level of knowledge and understanding that they have, any formal training or qualifications, and if this is applied to the business. So do staff just perform a task as they've been shown what to do, or do they know why they do these tasks? The importance of getting it right and the consequences if something is not performed correctly. Are staff up to date with the latest updates from HMRC and maintaining processes in line with any new requirements? They will also look at the record keeping practices of the company. They will be looking for historical accurate records for all imports, 
exports and tax transactions that have taken place over a period of a minimum of six years for tax purposes. The documents must be held in paper archive or electronically and to be able to be reproduced on paper at HMRC's request. HMRC will also be looking for any self-audit reports the business have carried out, any non-conformances that were found and identified, and the corrective and remedial actions that were put in place to remove the potential for future errors. And remember that HMRC are looking to find criminals who are on purpose avoiding payment of tax and or duty, and are therefore st stealing taxpayers' money. Therefore, they have similar criminal investigation powers to those of other law enforcement agencies and can apply for orders requiring information to be produced, search warrants, they can also make arrests, and following arrests, they can search suspects and premises for any evidence. So we're now going to take a look at what is best practice. Best practice is commercial or professional procedures that are accepted or prescribed as being correct or most effective. By custom standards, this means that the trader will maintain good records to document and evidence all imports and exports. They will have an archive process in place to maintain their records and documentation evidence, either in hard copy or electronically, for a minimum of six years for tax purposes. They will have a clear set of defined processes and standard operating procedures, SOPs in place, and staff will be trained in these practices to operate as efficiently as possible in their roles. Together with a clear set of internal guidelines, this will give a good standing for a trader to carry out their own audits, to review the effectiveness of their practices, and be given the opportunity to correct them through corrective and preventative actions. The procedures can form part of business standards, for example, ISO 9001 2015 Quality Management, which will be audited by external companies such as BSI. The procedures may cross functions, not just the International Trade Department, and may include the Accounts Department, Goods In and Dispatch, as well as the Warehouse. Being audited by an external company is another good example of working to best practice. SOX is the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 under US federal law, which mandates practices in financial record keeping and protects investors from corporate fraud. This was introduced following a number of major corporate and accounting scandals affecting companies such as Enron and Tyco International. The UK government have put forward proposals to reform internal controls legislation here in the UK, similar to that of SOX. And DAEO, Authorised Economic Operator, which is a company involved in international trade that has been approved by HMRC as complying with World Customs Organisation or equivalent standards. If you hold AEO authorisation, you will be audited by HMRC at some point to check that you are continuing to meet the criteria for the authorisation. The areas they will be interested in covering here are tax and customs compliance, customs record keeping, proven financial solvency, practical standard of competence or professional qualifications, and security and safety. And it's worth going back through the self-assessment questionnaire that was completed at the time of the application, just to check how up-to-date the company data is now versus when the application was submitted. To make sure that all parties in the supply chain understand what's required of them and to avoid disputes in the event that something goes wrong, it's important that traders put contracts in place between the buyer and the seller where both parties' obligations are clearly defined. The use of the correct inker term that reflects the transaction has been defined. Look at who is taking care of the freight element, who will be the exporter of record and the importer of record, and who is taking care of customs formalities. Review the risks and responsibilities in the International Chamber of Commerce's publication and make sure that the Inca term that meets the business's need is employed. And it must be written in full on the documentation, for example, CPT Paris or CIP Shanghai, along with the version of Inca terms being employed to be valid. Make sure that the version of Inca terms being used is written into contracts, invoices, 
purchase orders, order acknowledgements, and company terms and conditions. So for example, Inco Terms 2020, or you could still employ Inco Terms 2010. So that in the event of any legal action, all parties know which terms apply. If no version is listed, the version that was in place at the time of the contract was signed will be used in the sorry will be used as the basis in legal cases. Be clear with suppliers the documentation, certificates, and declarations that you require to import goods through customs, so that the correct amount of duty and tax are paid where applicable. Do any of the products require import licenses or certificates, for example, food products? By establishing these requirements up front with suppliers and buyers, you can ensure that the right information will be provided at the right time so that the customs transactions can be completed in a compliant manner. And back to you, Will, for our next poll. Thanks, Suzanne. I'm uh, going to launch a second poll now. This is just going to ask people how confident you are in, that you have the adequate documentation and evidence of customs compliance. So I'll just leave that poll running for a couple of minutes. I'm going to, going to do a couple of questions at the same time. Thank you, everyone, who sent questions in so far. Um, just to remind everyone that if you send in questions which are concise, and easy for me to read, but also relevant to the wider audience, uh, not too specific to your own company or situation, I'm more likely to ask those questions. Um, but this is a goodie from Paul, which actually follows on from the previous webinar I mentioned earlier on the kind of post-declaration compliance requirements. So Paul says uh, he was under the impression that compliance obligations end when a declaration is submitted and a C88 is archived. That's not the case though, is it Suzanne? It, it sounds like it should be the end because you've got the final import documents to evidence that import. Um, you've paid your duty and your tax, but it's not actually the end of compliance obligations. So as we've mentioned before about record keeping, traders need to keep these documents on file and hold them for um, a minimum of six years for tax purposes. So your compliance will end sort of at the end of that period. So you've got to make sure that you've got robust record keeping um, methods in place, so either archiving or electronic storage, and they, you're able to reproduce those documents at the request of HMRC. So yes, really that compliance can go on right through to the end of um, the requirement of that tax period. And I had a question in from Tabitha, which is asking, is there a template of how to actually record your data? Um, no, there isn't a template as such. Um, Traders can uh, often create their own records sort of by downloading from their own ERP system, or some may choose to keep their records in a, an Excel document. So the desk staff will just update it as they ship out the imports and the exports, um, just listing any of that key data. There is guidance on gov.uk that will sort of explain the data that is required. Um, this can be found in Notice 703 that we do have a link on uh, one of our upcoming slides actually. The other thing um, as well is that traders can sign up for the management support system, the MSS reports, and receive data from HMRC for all their recorded imports and exports. Um, this does come over in an Excel format, and it should really be used as a cross-reference document to traders' own records. Um, and traders must check the report for any errors or anomalies and report them immediately. Um, but this template can actually give you an idea of the type of data uh, that you could be maintaining yourself in your own records. Thanks, Suzanne. And uh, just to remind everyone, I've posted the link to the previous webinar we did on compliance requirements. Um, so that's in the chat, and uh, we'll be including that in the follow-up message as well. But I'm going to close the poll result now. Once again, thank you for answering. Uh, so 56% of you are quite confident, and 21% of you very confident that your business has kept adequate documentation and evidence of compliance. So that means only 14% of you not very confident and only 2% of you not at all confident. So Suzanne, it's quite a confident audience we have with us today, um, but definitely some room um, for, for people to become more confident. Yes, I think that that's a really good result as well. It does show that companies are doing what they can to be compliant. People are aware of the rules and they do change, especially after Brexit 
um, bringing in Europe into the international trade requirements does mean that companies have had um, new requirements to get used to. So it's really good to see that you know that we've got um, you know 77% of the audience today are um, either quite or very confident that they're keeping those records, and that's what HMRC are looking for as well. That people are doing the best that they can with their best practice and their due diligence to be as compliant as they can. So yes, that's really good to see. On those that are not at all or not that confident, again they could be new to um, the requirements having only really traded in, in Europe previously and the requirements have changed. So hopefully there's some useful information in our webinar today and pointers for people to actually go and do a bit more research and work themselves so that they too can become as confident in compliance as the, the other people on the call today. Thanks, Suzanne, and thank you everyone for answering again. Uh, just getting a flurry of questions through an MSS data, that, that topic was covered to, to quite a, uh, a great extent on that previous webinar, so I will refer people to, to that webinar if, 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 we, if we may, and um, we'll post any useful links about MSS data in the follow-up as well. But uh, conscious of time, so back to you, Suzanne. Thanks, Will. <clears throat> So now we're going to have a look at the customs documentation and the VRT requirements. So let's have a look at the type of documentary evidence uh, that is required. So for any imports, official customs documentation must be received to demonstrate the acceptance of the goods to be brought into the UK through the border by customs. These are evidenced in the C88, the single administrative document that details the data of products being imported. And the E2 document, which is the entry acceptance form received for all goods imported into the UK. And this details the tax and duty that has been paid or if VAT has been deferred. Traders must make sure that they give clear instructions to their intermediaries if they are creating their customs entries. They must provide documentation that displays the commodity code, country of origin, any preference statements, the value of the goods and the breakdown of the freight and insurance element. By issuing a direct representation authorization to the intermediary, they give them the power to enter customs declarations on behalf of the trader using their EORI number and can also give permission to use their duty deferment account and to postpone VAT on the import as well. For exports, certificates of shipment that evidence the goods have left the UK are important. Along with the commercial transport documents, such as an airway bill or a bill of lading, or a CMR note for road transport that's been stamped and signed by the receiving warehouse in the country of destination. They all evidence that the goods have left the UK. By having a duty deferment account in place, this allows for any duty due at import to be put into an account which will be settled on a monthly basis. Again, this evidence is compliance to HMRC that duties have been accounted for and paid on a regular basis when due. And preference declarations. Have you been able to zero rate duty for goods brought into the UK from the EU or other countries the UK may have a trade deal with? Have you got the evidence from the supplier declaring the country of origin that has been used to zero rate the duty at import? All of the above must be held on file to demonstrate compliance to customs regulations. Exporting is one of the customs special procedure categories that manages the suspension of VAT. Goods are allowed to be zero rated for VAT if they're exported as VAT is only charged on goods that remain in the UK. However, in order to zero rate goods, traders need to retain evidence to prove the goods have been exported, as we just mentioned. These are in the form of official evidence, which is the goods departure message, and commercial transport evidence, which describes the physical movement of the goods, authenticated bills of lading or airway bills, certificates of shipments, and CMR notes. They are the official evidence. It can then be followed up with supplementary evidence. So this is required as well. And these are contracts of sale between the buyer and the seller, a customer's purchase order, invoices, packing lists, evidence of payment as well, and evidence of receipt of goods overseas and proofs of delivery. Inca terms are important as well when an overseas customer arranges the freight from the UK under FCA terms, for example. 
the supplier must make sure that they receive the required evidence, otherwise they will become liable for payment of the VAT. Evidence must be gathered within three months of the date of shipment and held on file for a minimum of six years. If unsatisfactory evidence has been obtained to support the export, then VAT will be due. And we have a link here to VAT Notice 703, which gives further details on what's required for the proof of export, as I mentioned earlier on the uh, caller's question, as well as the customs declarations issued on a shipment basis. You will also receive a C79 certificate from HMRC to evidence the amount of import VAT that has been paid. If you're using Chief to make the customs declarations, these will be sent to you on a monthly basis. But if you're using CDS, then you can go onto your Government Gateway account and then download these online. This is a good way to check that all imports have been registered and the correct amount of VAT has been paid. And this data can also be cross-referenced with the MSS report. However, if you have used postponed VAT accounting, these imports will not be shown on the C79 certificate. It will only cover the amounts that have actually been paid. We're now going to have a look at the special procedures and movements that require HMRC authorizations to be exported or imported and the implications for HMRC audits for these special audit requirements. As well as import and export documentation, there are other factors that HMRC will take into consideration when carrying out an audit and may ask for evidence on how a trader arrived at the origin status of the goods. They will want to look at bills of material and then looking at each individual component, raw material, they will start to look at the purchase history, any origin evidence that was supplied, such as suppliers declaration, statements on origin, as well as the origin declarations on invoices. They would want to look at the process and data that was used to apply accumulation and how the origin percentage and value was built up to claim the preference. They would also be interested to see how this is managed in the case of a change of supplier, especially if they're in a different country or the UK compared to the original supplier. They would want to know how a trader arrived at preferential or non-preferential origin status. Any incorrect claims could result in a repayment of any duty or potential fines. They would also be interested in how a trader classifies the goods. How did they select the commodity codes? They'd be looking at the product history, technical information and product specifications, evidences to the process of how a classification was reached. And if a trader is unsure of classification, if they have applied for any advanced tariff rulings from customs to determine a commodity code for a product. Duty reclaims can go back three years if incorrect classification has led to underpayments of duty and VAT at import and it may have an impact on customers that the goods were sold to. They may also have made an incorrect declaration to customs at their imports and they may have to rectify that too. HMRC would also be interested in how the goods are valued. They would review purchase and sales data and check the valuation is in line with World Trade Organization valuation principles and that the value evidence held on file matches the value paid. They would look at additional costs that are included in the valuation buildup, for example, agent's commission or price break discounts. Any goods that fall under the control, prohibited and restricted goods, where import or export licenses are required. Any food products that require export health certificates or CHED documents for products of animal origin or byproducts, phytosanitary certificates for plant health, catch certificates and processing statements for fish. HMRC would also check these documents to make sure the products are complying with import and export regulations. Goods that are moved under customs special procedures, such as customs warehousing, inward and outward processing, temporary admission or end use, as well as free zones or customs excise warehouse keeper authorizations, will be subject to tighter restrictions and close scrutiny of customs as traders moving goods under these requirements are moving goods under duty suspension with an outstanding tax liability. And they will have authorized 
they would have been authorised by HMRC to do so. They will all require good record keeping of movements in and out of the procedure and documentary evidence of what happened to the goods whilst under the procedure. They will require evidence of discharge for supply chain traceability and evidence that the goods qualify for any duty relief. If a trader has been authorised to use simplified declarations at import under CFSP, the trader will need to be able to demonstrate that they adhere to the standards. They will also need to be able to show the simplified frontier declaration and the follow-up supplementary declaration to evidence that the declarations have been completed. Any kind of special authorization by HMRC is likely to be subject to being audited to maintain the integrity of the authorizations they give. We're now going to look at what happens after a HMRC audit. So after the audit, the officer in attendance is not going to give anything away during the audit. They'll take all the information evidence that you've provided away to review it and they'll check if any other further information is required. They'll get in touch to make the request if they do need any further information. HMRC will write to you to tell you the results of the check. If you have paid too much tax, they will repay this to you and you may get interest on the amount you're owed. If you've not paid sufficient tax, you'll be asked to make payment of the monies owed within 30 days and you would normally have to pay interest from the date the tax was due. Following the findings, you will need to check your records to find out how the errors were made and will need to demonstrate to HMRC that corrective actions have been put in place to prevent such an error occurring in the future. You may also have to pay a penalty. HMRC will look at the reasons for the underpayment or overclaim tax, whether this was an oversight or a deliberate act of fraud. They will look at whether you have told HMRC as soon as you identified any errors and how helpful you have been to facilitate the audit, providing any evidence that was requested. If you would have a problem with payment, then you must tell the officer dealing with the cheque. For example, where a company is not able to repay a large tax debt, they may be given a period of time to make regular payments to reduce the debt and pay it off, although this will be subject to an interest charge. If, of course, you disagree with the decision, there is a process in place to appeal the tax decision. Following the submission of the next tax return, HMRC may decide to come and audit again and check that the corrective measures are in place and the tax is now being reported correctly. So, Will, we'll hand back to you for our next poll. Thank you, Suzanne. And this is our last poll uh, before we get into the, the final section and a few more questions. But we're just going to ask, how prepared would you feel if a HMRC audit were to happen in your business tomorrow? Uh, the options are, I hope, are quite self-explanatory. Uh, so we're going to do a couple more questions. Just to remind everyone, um, do try to keep these questions as simple as possible. We will have a time for a few more questions, but um, we are getting a lot in and I'm going to ask ones which are being asked by a few different people. Um, so apologies if we don't get to your question today. But here's one from Calvert. A few other people have asked it as well. It seems quite an obvious one. What happens if you fail an HMRC audit and how can you recover from a failed audit? Yes, so the findings of an audit will show any areas of non-compliance and will highlight areas for improvement. As a business, these findings will need to be addressed and any remedial action taken to correct those errors and update processes and procedures so that the errors don't reoccur. So in the event that the company has avoided the payment of tax and duty on purpose and has been deemed to be deliberate fraud by HMRC, then the penalties may be charged. Audit failures can affect a company's brand, affecting trade with customers or suppliers, who, if they hear of the failure, may pull any lines of credit for fear of non-payment, or at worst, no longer trade with a company. The reputation of the company may be difficult to recover, and customers and suppliers may be concerned with that too, you know, being linked to a company that's committed fraud, as, they, as it's seen, um, they may themselves come under scrutiny of any compliance check. Um, it can also disengage employees and other stakeholders and have a detrimental effect on investors. So it's also looking at sort of the seriousness of why the business has failed. 
you know if you fail an audit because something has been flagged up because it's not quite right and you can put those measures in place it may be seen as a fail but actually you are working with HMRC to correct those errors so really the issues are going to come if you have purpose purposefully avoided paying those taxes and duties and, and that it is something that got uncovered and that's really what uh, HMRC don't, don't want customers to be doing. Thank you, Suzanne. And do one more question now. Uh, this is from Janice. A few people asked it. What are the timescales once your business has submitted all the documents and answered any follow-up questions relating to the audit? When can you expect an audit and for the audit to be uh, an outcome and for the audit to be closed? So this is going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, as you can appreciate. Every business is different, um, and it really depends on the findings of the audit. If it was just a quick check whether they're actually going to go really in depth and look at absolutely everything. So it may take quite a while to actually get all the correct documentation together to submit to HMRC. But what they are looking at is any underpaid or maybe overpaid tax or duty. So HMRC do have a duty themselves to get this resolved as quickly as possible and to get that outstanding money in. So it shouldn't drag on you know as long as you are as cooperative as you can be with providing the information and answering any questions i would think that they would resolve most quite quite quickly um, they will inform you of the outcome and then you've got up to 30 days to settle any of the outstanding taxes due or raise a dispute again if you are not happy with the outcome great thank you suzanne uh time is off yes and so i'm going to quickly share the result of that poll uh, Sixty-five percent of you quite prepared, and eight percent of you very prepared. Uh, again, not surprised if, if, if it's happening tomorrow, then it's, it's going to be a bit of a shock, I imagine, if you haven't been told before. Um, but seventeen percent of you not very prepared, three percent of you not at all prepared, and six percent not sure. So most of you are feeling quite confident, I'd say. Um, but thank you for responding. Uh, and Suzanne, uh, I'm going to hand back to you for the last few slides. Thank you. So we're now going to have a look at preparing for HMRC and also final considerations. The best place to start is really to discuss HMRC's request for an audit with your accountant. Get them to check through your records, see if there's any inconsistencies or problems on the tax returns that may be prompted the requirement for an audit. But it also gives you the opportunity to start working on any anomaly that they have found. You may wish to have the accountant present during the physical audit. Or alternatively, you can actually ask the accountant to deal with HMRC on your behalf. But they will require a formal authorisation to be in place or a temporary authorisation if a formal authorisation is not already set up. It's important to make sure any commercial paperwork has been issued correctly and there is guidance on gov.uk if traders need further information. For example, the use of INCA terms if you're trading XWorks or DDP. HMRC can see this on, on the outputs from Chief and CDS and they would therefore be interested to know what's happening with the VAT on these transactions as they would point to an overseas company needing to be registered in the UK to make payment of any duties and tax that are due to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Where FCA was used and an overseas customer arranges transport, they would need to know the goods left the country, so they will be looking for that proof, the official customs evidence and the commercial supporting evidence. It's also good practice to have an internal compliance program in place and to sign up for the management support system, the MSS reports we've mentioned, to monitor your imports and your exports. This all shows due diligence and good compliance practice to HMRC. And then you should be in a good position to carry out your own internal audits as well, to check your processes and procedures are compliant. Again, here, any errors or problems with the processes can be flagged up and action through preventative and corrective actions. So all this documented on file is again good compliance evidence for HMRC. So the final points for consideration with regards to being prepared for a HMRC audit are business awareness. It might sound simple to say, but do you know that the staff follow the procedures that are laid down? Are there any possibilities for complacency to step in? And if, if this is being trained internally to new staff, is the full procedure being followed? Make sure staff are aware of the importance of following procedures and consequences to the business if they're not followed. Is your record keeping robust? 
how does your company maintain its records? Are they held on file in physical copies or are they held electronically? Are they easily retrievable? And can this storage be maintained for the minimum time period? Is the server where any electronic records being held safe and secure? And will it be maintained for the required time period? And how are staff trained? If it's internally, is this written down formally, documented and reviewed? Do any staff require external training to keep them up to date with the latest requirements? Make sure that any procedures and processes are regularly reviewed for applicability and carry out your own internal audit so that you can identify any areas where the processes are not working and may require an update to the functionality. By recording the non-conformances and putting remedial actions in place to prevent errors, this all demonstrates good compliance. And finally, audit third parties. Visit suppliers and customers and your freight forwarders and agents and get an understanding of their business. This helps to carry out due diligence so that you understand the partners you're working with. You can also ensure that they're aware of the responsibilities and you can share best practice advice as well to work together. And back to you, Will. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. A really great overview there of um, what will be becoming, I suppose, increasingly an important topic for many businesses over the next few years. We have a few uh, more minutes for questions. So I'm going to ask again, as noted before, questions which a few of you have been asking, trying to group things together where possible. Uh, beginning with uh, one from Andrew, which is typical of one we've had a lot of people asking. He asks, what is HMI, sorry, what is HMRC's stance if you have requested documentation from your broker and are continuing to chase them, but they have not provided you with that documentation? That's actually a very common issue. So I can imagine we have had quite a few people asking that question today. Um, so where you engage with a freight forwarder, they are likely to be subcontracting the customs declaration element maybe to a third party, not necessarily doing it in-house. In and this is where it becomes difficult to chase up the documentation because they're much further down the chain and they have other requirements as to why they would have been putting that in place. Um, firstly, you need to make sure that you're working with a reputable freight forwarder and a customs agent. And the best way to do this is to not work with a large number of forwarders on a spot ba basis, again, which is common practice. You're not likely to get the best service from those people, and they're also not going to pay much attention to you. Keep asking for uh, the documentation to be sent through. What you should really do is sort of nominate one or two freight forwarders, depending on your requirements and their agents or even your own agent and put a written contract in place that details your requirements, including in there to send you a copy of the documents once they're completed. And you need to make sure as well that it's not the pre lodge version because they may just lodge it on the system and send you that through. What you actually need is the final goods departure notice for exports and the arrival notice for the import. On an order by order basis, it's also a good practice to reiterate those instructions, send them through full details of the requirements, what you're expecting. Remember that you will be the exporter or the importer on record. Therefore, you need to make sure any agent acting on your behalf processes the right data for you. They can only do this if you give them that data and you make clear your requirements of what you expect. Hold them responsible for the declarations as well. Give them a deadline to issue the documents and follow up immediately after the shipment. Whilst the shipment is live, you have more chance of getting a response and getting the documentations that you need. If you're chasing up a few months down the line or maybe even when HMRC are coming into audit, it becomes much harder because those documents could well be in an archive. There could even be an off-site storage where there is limited access and they're not going to go and get that, go up the road to in a self-storage location and obtain that one document that you're looking for. The agency is also acting on the trader's behalf. Therefore, there must be a direct representative authorization in place so that the agent acts on the trader's behalf. Even though they act on the trader's behalf, it's still the trader who is liable for any outstanding tax on the shipments, even if the agent has not completed it correctly. And as you don't hold the official evidence on file, 
because you've not been able to obtain it, then again, it's worth applying for a copy of the MSS reports that we've mentioned a few times today, as this does evidence at least that those transactions have been put against your EORI number. And certainly if you have been chasing, archive or print and store these emails in the import export files as evidence, then you can at least evidence that you've done your best to chase it up. Thanks, Susanna. And I'll ask another question on a similar theme, just because we've began getting so many questions on this. Um, this is one from Claire, which I thought was a good one. We don't make the declarations ourselves, so how do we access the required documentation and her firm sells XWorks and Free Carrier Inca terms? Yeah, so again, we've got Inca terms, which again, we've mentioned quite a bit today. Um, you've got to have a look at the actual responsibilities. XWorks means that the buyer in the overseas country is the X exporter of record. So an overseas company is responsible for exporting goods out of the UK and this means that they've got to be registered in the UK to be able to issue or have those export declarations issued. You need to evidence that the goods have left the country, therefore you require a copy of the official evidence where possible that links with the invoice. So for example the export declaration raised in the name of the customer as exporter will detail the invoice number from the supplier against the commodity code. You'll also require a certificate of shipment detailing the overseas movement. So you're not necessarily going to get an actual copy of the airway bill or the bill of lading, but the certificate of shipment should document that and it should link them all together. And again, the invoice number is quite key to referring it all back to the evidence that the trader is holding. Um, it's more appropriate for UK-based supply to be registered for export and be the exporter on record. So FCA is the more appropriate term here. So for the F FCA INCO terms, um, your company are the exporter of record and are responsible for having those declarations then issued in your name. So that's the difference with XWorks. XWorks would be in the overseas company's name, whereas FCA is going to be in your company's name. So it's good practice to contact the customer's agent, again, building up those relationships, rather than just trying to deal wholly with the overseas customer who will just want to receive the goods and will not be interested in the customer's arrangements. <clears throat> so as exporter of record, again, it's your responsibility to ensure that all the documentation is issued correctly. And again, using the invoice to link everything all together and making sure that you get copies of those transport documents as well. Again, stamped, received in the overseas warehouse, that proves those goods travelled overseas. So even though you've not been involved in that transport arrangement, you are getting those transport documents back as well. And you can hold all that on, on file as evidence to prove that your goods were exported. Thank you, Suzanne. It's a, a couple of chunky answers to a couple of chunky questions, <laughs> fair to say. Um, but yeah, I've, we were talking about this before the webinar. These are really important questions um, which you are asking. So hopefully that has helped everyone. Uh, I appreciate we're running slightly over, but I'm going to do two more questions because I think they're both really good ones. Um, and a few people have been asking about transit, including Melissa, who says, can you explain the evidence required for a transshipment? For example, we have many customers in Eastern Europe who will ship from the UK to Italy and then onwards uh, to another non-EU country. Uh, do we need evidence for both journeys? Um, so the best source again for this is the um, Customs Notice 703. Um, we've mentioned that a couple of times today. It's definitely a good, a good document to, to read up on. So in a transshipment example, you need to look at the contract and who is responsible for what, which can be defined with the INCO term plus the place of destination. So what is the final destination to where you want to deliver the goods? Start off by looking at who you are invoicing, the place of delivery, that you're evidencing the paperwork. So for example, do you put down the address in Italy or do you put the address in uh, Russia, for example? And again, if you are dealing with Russia, again, just double check the sanction requirements to see whether your goods um, can actually um, be exported to Russia under the current conditions. If you're just moving the goods over to um, the transshipment hub in Italy, then you would expect to see just the Italian address. Whereas if the goods are actually going into a depot in Italy and then moving out to Russia, then you would see the Russian address on the paperwork. So if the goods travel from the UK to Russia via Italy, this involves the transit process and TIR can be used, but this will only apply if the vehicle is sealed from the start of the journey at the office of departure in the UK. 
through to the transit office in Italy and then over to the final office of destination where the TIR would be discharged in Russia. And this route again would need to be approved by the office of departure. You may have a CMR note and a T1 document for the transit for Europe as well because we're part of the common transit agreement. And this takes the goods up to the warehouse in Italy. You can check the arrival of the T1 document and the discharge from the transit journey on the transit MRN checker on the Europa website. So you just need that long barcode number off the top right hand corner of the document. The CMR note can just be signed by the warehouse's receipt of the goods up to Italy. And then when it's discharged from that transit journey, again, this is all used as evidence of that journey up to Italy. If your goods are going to continue on the same vehicle all the way, then they're subject to the TIR transit. And you would be able to get that stamp document to prove that it was discharged when it arrived at the final destination. Therefore, it's important to understand the contract that you've got in place with the customer, the Inca term, the place of delivery, and understanding where your responsibilities end. So we, even though the goods go all the way up to Russia, your responsibilities may well end in Italy. So just check, check those, um, those uh, contractual arrangements out with your customer. Thank you, Suzanne. And we'll do one last question. I can see people starting to drop off. So one last question. Uh, and we've had a few people ask about leniency uh, from H HMRC, including Julie, who says, does HMRC have a disclosure policy where when leniency is offered in penalty applications if the importer discovers and discloses first? Um, so yes, so HMRC do have a disclosure service where you can make a disclosure if your company has not declared all income or gains. Article 42 of EC 952-2013 details the application of penalties where failure to comply with customs legislation shall be provided and these shall be effective, proportionate and dissuasive in the form of pecuniary charges where appropriate and the revocation, suspension or amendment of any authorizations that are held. HMRC will review this on a case-by-case -case basis, but best practice is to notify HMRC of any error that you discover, no matter how small it is, and then they can decide how best to deal with it. Failure to disclose any error which you knew about and covered up that is then later discovered, that's likely to then warrant much more severe action on the part of HMRC. So honesty is definitely the best policy in, in this instance. Thanks, Suzanne. And I'm sure like in other walks of life of HMRC, the, the, if you're honest with them and, and not part of them, they'll, they'll usually appreciate that more than anything else. But um, thank you so much for what I think was a really excellent presentation, particularly complementing the, the previous webinar we did on customs compliance a few weeks ago, which if you haven't seen, the recording of that webinar and this webinar will be um, on our YouTube very shortly and will be sent to you after this webinar. But uh, on the next slide, I'm afraid we have run out of time for questions. So thank you again for Suzanne for your presentation and for answering the queries we got to today. We hope everyone has found that useful. On this slide, you will see some of the support the IRE and IT provides to traders, including training, consultancy, our lunchtime learning webinars for members and much, much more. And um, so if you do have questions which are left unanswered today, then there's, there's a, a fair few ways we can support you going forwards. The IUNIT continues to be on hand to support businesses to trade compliantly during an ever-changing trade landscape, whether that's due to Brexit, climate change, or the war in Ukraine. Export.org.uk is where you can find more information about all of our services. Just a reminder that we will be sending all registrants a recording of today's webinar along with a copy of the slides over the next day or so. Please get in touch if for any reason this email doesn't come through to your main inbox. As you leave, please do let us know what you thought of today's webinar and any suggestions for topics on future webinars uh, by completing the exit survey. We will be continuing to run a uh, various free webinars over the summer. This includes in May, we're doing a webinar on new ENS declaration requirements and the chief to CDS migration. So we hope everyone will find those useful. But for now, thank you for joining us today and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks everyone, goodbye.